So good afternoon. Welcome to the Green Park Collaborative webinar on the College of American Pathologists Accreditation Standards and Proficiency Testing for Diagnostic Next Generation Sequencing. Uh, this is Donna Messner speaking. I'm Senior Vice President at the Center for Medical Technology Policy, and I lead the Green Park Program, which is a major initiative of our center. Um, I've also been leading Green Park's work on uh, personalized medicine. I'm joined here in our office in Baltimore, Maryland, by uh, Jen Alnaber, our Green Park Program Manager, and Julie Simmons, our Marketing and Communications Manager, and Janelle King, our um, expert uh, executive admin. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Jonathan Miles and Helena Duncan at the College of American Pathologists for their help and collaboration in making this event possible. And of course, I uh, want to thank our speaker, who I'll introduce in just a couple of moments. Um, first, let's go over some housekeeping notes. This webinar is being recorded, and um, with the assent of our speaker, we'll post it at our website after the uh, webinar is over. Um, everyone is muted. Um, uh, all the participants are muted. As our speaker is talking, please feel free to submit questions through the chat feature of the webinar. We'll address as many of those as we can in the latter portion of the hour. Um, many of you know that it's kind of unusual for us to do webinars where participant communication is limited to chat uh, because we like to be able to encourage open dialogue and um, so, yeah, but you know, with this many people, we've got a lot of people on this webinar today, so unmuting everybody would be kind of chaotic. So, you know, we don't want you to have to listen to each other's barking dogs and crying babies and music. And so, for people who really want to vocalize questions later, we will ask the operator to open up a line and facilitate a queue for voice questions and comments and hopefully that will get us closer to the dialogue feel we like to have on our calls. Um, so very quickly, uh, I want to give some background to explain why we're hosting this webinar and what we hope to accomplish. On this slide, you see a concise history of CMTP's work on generating evidence of clinical utility in genomics and working towards a shared understanding of what is needed for policy decisions. These are just the major milestones. A lot happened between these major meetings and publications. But um, basically, we first began work on a guidance document on clinical utility for molecular diagnostics in about 2011, uh, which is when I joined CMTP, by the way, with funding from the WellPoint Foundation, which is now Anthem. That does not mean that Anthem endorses everything that we've done since then, but I do want to acknowledge that their support got us started um, in this line of work, and, and we're very grateful for that. At that time, uh, we were looking at a plethora of what we now might call sort of old-fashioned molecular diagnostic tests, and we were asking why so many of them weren't covered. Uh, the answer, as it turns out, was that many of them lacked evidence of clinical utility, and some of them really didn't even have high-quality clinical validation data. So we went through a lengthy, multi-stakeholder process to develop recommendations for filling that evidence gap. Uh, but even as we were developing those recommendations, sequencing technology was advancing rapidly. So as soon as we finished that work, it was apparent that there were issues we still needed to address regarding clinical utility and coverage for high-throughput sequencing. In the course of that work, a recurring concern was expressed about high-throughput sequencing platforms. For payers and consumers paying for tests, there was no way for them to know whether for a given gene the consistency and reliability of variants detected would be comparable across laboratories. So they really didn't know what they were paying for. Um, so a key conclusion in our 2015 report listed here was that there needed to be a robust, independent, transparent process for assuring consistency and quality of clinical sequencing, a process payers and other decision makers could rely on, such as potentially the one that was being developed by the College of American Pathologists at that time, and which you'll be hearing about today. Uh, a great deal of credit goes to the college for their leadership in this area and the work they've put into this program. 
Um, so the purpose of today's webinar is to promote understanding of the accreditation program amongst all stakeholders uh, and our payers, um, to foster transparency, and promote dialogue on how the program should continue to evolve, um, which I hope will build trust and confidence, not only in the quality of the program itself, but also in the quality of laboratories participating in the program. So that's what we're doing here today. And with that background, um, it is my honor to introduce to you Carl Volkerding. Uh, he received his medical degree from the University of Cincinnati Medical College of Medicine in 1983, and then completed postdoctoral research and clinical training in molecular biology and clinical pathology. In 1990, he joined the faculty of the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he developed and directed a molecular diagnostics laboratory while also practicing transfusion medicine. In 2001, he served as president of the Association for Molecular Pathology, and in 2002, he moved to Salt Lake City, Utah to join the ARUP laboratories. Currently, he's a professor of pathology at the University of Utah and a medical director of genomics and bioinformatics at the ARUP laboratories. Dr. Volkerding is, a certified, is board certified in clinical pathology and molecular genetic pathology, he has a long-standing involvement in the translation of new technologies into molecular diagnostics, and this interest is focused over the past several years on next-generation sequencing. He is currently the chair of the College of American Pathologists project team on next-generation sequencing, which is responsible for developing laboratory accreditation requirements and proficiency testing programs for clinical next-generation sequencing. So, Dr. Volkerding, thank you for being with us today, and I'll pass the baton to you. Great. Uh, Donna, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. It is a pleasure to address uh, the audience today. And I'm hoping everything works well here with advancing the slides. We should be, if we're all on track, we're, we should see a slide that at the top says College of American Pathologists NGS Project Team, which was established in 2011 uh, as the college was beginning to monitor the diagnostic translation of next generation sequencing into clinical laboratories. Uh, it was clear that we needed to have a, uh, a special uh, sort of focus on uh, moving into providing guidance, accreditation, and proficiency testing for this new area. So the charter of the project team has been to address accreditation, proficiency testing, and to evolve as new areas uh, have have grown in NGS applications. So one of the things as we set off uh, to develop accreditation requirements is we really wanted to find a good regulatory balance as our guiding principle. We wanted to foster the innovation of this uh, exciting and powerful technology into clinical laboratory testing but also to assure patient safety uh, in so doing. And we published our first set of accreditation requirements in 2012, and then they have been edited and revised uh, from the foundational requirements each year as the field has advanced, advanced and diversified in its applications. So one of the first things we had to do when uh, we started this process was to essentially define what we would refer to as an NGS test. And it was important to set some parameters in this regard. So we had to define the analytical process, and we also had to uh, determine where we would uh, sort of uh, essentially move into medical practice. So as you can see on this particular slide, the analytical laboratory process encompasses the traditional 
what we've referred to as wet bench of handling the sample, preparing a library, and sequencing it. And then uh, somewhat unique to this technology, although not, ex you know, not entirely unique, is that you generate data which then goes into downstream analytical processes. And uh, so we referred to that as sort of the dry bench process of bioinformatics. Uh, where the sequence information is essentially analyzed and asked what is different about this information in this patient from a reference sequence. And those annotated variants of what is different, what is variant from a reference or wild type sequence are essentially the foundational information that is used for interpretation and reporting. So based on this uh, essentially definition of a next generation sequencing test, we organized a series of accreditation requirements or drafted and organized them. And now on the next slide, the uh, current accreditation requirements in 2016, and I do refer to 2016 because the accreditation requirements are updated on a yearly basis and the 2017 requirements will be published in late July, typically. So under the 2016 requirements, which is what laboratories are operating under at the present, you can see that we basically organize these accreditation requirements into different themes in terms of, in the center, you can see the wet bench and the bioinformatics. Uh, key elements of all laboratory testing are covered here in terms of documentation, the necessity of a laboratory to demonstrate its validation of any particular test. We have a quality management uh, plan in, uh, in, in place. And then um, uh, essentially sort of we took general principles of laboratory testing and applied them to next generation sequencing. And I'd like to talk about some of these in a little bit more detail. And I'd also like to state that these requirements are foundational requirements that are applied whether one is doing testing for inherited disorders or for molecular oncology using next generation sequencing. Uh, and now we're seeing labs moving into using next generation sequencing for a variety of other areas including uh, microbiology applications, including tissue typing, HLA sequencing. And this is an example format of a CAP accreditation requirement. I just pulled one out to kind of give you a flavor of how an accreditation requirement looks on an actual document if one has not had the opportunity to see that. There will be an actual requirement number, which in this one is uh, MOL.36135, just to orient us. And this particular requirement is referring to um, the fact that when, when one updates their bioinformatics or data processing pipeline, that the laboratory has a procedure for when they're going to do that, and when they do it, how do they actually determine that an upgrade or an update is still performing in an expected manner. And so that's basically comparing it with uh, samples that one has already validated, typically. And then so the, you have the requirement, then you have notes that help provide a little more context for the laboratory, a little more guidance. And then importantly below, you'll see in the lower part of the slide, it says evidence of compliance. And that's very important because the evidence of compliance really tells the laboratory what is it that you should be able to demonstrate when you are going through this process and what should you be able to document. And also importantly, when a laboratory is inspected, in this case um, inspected for their next generation sequencing testing, uh, an inspector can say, show me your evidence of compliance uh, pertinent to this particular requirement. And um, so we've we, uh, this particular one, you can see I've been able to encompass it all onto one slide, but a number of our requirements for um, 
uh, next generation sequencing, the uh, requirement in the notes sections go on for one to two pages in length because they're quite lengthy and involved. Now, um, the, circling back to the overview of the different requirements in 2016, I want to talk a little bit about this particular area of primary versus referring laboratory, uh, which is uh, a very interesting area in terms of some configurations of how laboratories are performing their next generation sequencing. So now on the next slide, um, essentially what I would state though is that the majority, the overwhelming majority of laboratories that are performing next generation sequencing are performing it in one physical primary laboratory and therefore they're under a single CLIA license for that laboratory operation. So they're in the same domain, if you will, same physical domain. They're doing their sequencing, their bioinformatics processing, and then uh, the results are being reviewed and reported. Interestingly, though, we have scenarios, a few, but it's not clear to me how how this will unfold over the next few years, but we certainly have some scenarios where we have a primary laboratory that receives a patient sample. They may perform the sequencing, and then they send, send the sequencing data. They outsource it to a facility that then performs the bioinformatics, the alignment, the variant identification, and may add certain levels of metadata to that, and then they send that back to the primary laboratory that done, then does the final interpretation and reporting. Now, interestingly, in this model, uh, the viewpoint under CLIA is that this is what would be referred to as a distributive testing model. And in that regard, um, what I mean by that is that it's essentially the test is being uh, compartmentalized into different uh, actual physical locations where operations are taking place. And so when you set up a test in this kind of configuration, you need the primary laboratory needs to work exquisitely closely with the reference laboratory to develop an overall test process that is validated. Another variation on this theme, uh, in fact, I just recently saw a variation on this uh, theme, uh, is that the primary lab receives the patient sample. They may actually process the sample to the point of extracting DNA or RNA. Uh, or they may, uh, and then they outsource that to a reference laboratory that does the sequencing, and then the sequencing data is sent back to the primary laboratory, and the primary laboratory performs the bioinformatic process and the interpretation and reporting. And in this kind of configuration, um, laboratories are establishing basically uh, data upload and data download service uh, act, uh, approaches, uh, essentially utilizing cloud-based uh, HIPAA-compliant uh, environments. And, and <clears throat> you might ask, well, why would a laboratory um, distribute their test? In this type of scenario that I'm showing currently, they may distribute, this, they may send the sample out because they want some other laboratory to assume the cost of operating and running the uh, capital intensive uh, sequencing process. Alternatively, a, laborat a laboratory may feel more comfortable uh, and may be willing to assume the capital cost of the sequencing, but yet they don't have the expertise to uh, uh, personnel, if you will, to, uh, in their environment to run the bioinformatics, and then they work collaboratively with a reference laboratory that has that. So although most labs are trying to do this all under one roof, uh, we are seeing some scenarios like this.
Uh, now, circling back to the primary requirements, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the validation process. So back to our sort of definition of a sequencing test. Um, essentially, in the wet bench and the bioinformatics dry process, even though uh, in our accreditation requirements we have things listed out in a separate fashion, we're very clear in the requirements that uh, when one performs this type of testing that you very much uh, need to have an integrated approach based on a methods uh, philosophy. Because in this case, with next generation sequencing, you may be looking for certain mutations or pathogenic variants, if you will, but you're off often identifying uh, uh, variants that need to be interpreted that a priori you cannot predict. So you have to essentially uh, approach this as a methods, trying to identify variants as sensitively and specifically as possible. And so when one sets up a test like this, uh, you have to choose samples to uh, essentially determine the uh, performance of your test in a pilot manner, typically, and then you run a formal validation uh, in which uh, samples are examined through your methodology, and you want your specimens to have a representative spectrum of the variant types that your test is designed to detect. And essentially through this process, you will determine your assay performance as through the validation uh, elements that you've established. Now some new things that we did in 2016, uh, as I said, each year we look at the requirements, we update the requirements, and um, we go through that process. So um, in 2016, one of the questions became, if you're doing a gene panel, uh, with using your gene panel, sometimes you uh, are looking for specific um, mutations. For example, let's talk about a, an oncology panel. You might have specific hotspot mutations that are relevant to therapeutic response, prognostic uh, categorization. And you want to make certain that for this type of gene panel, that you're absolutely certain that you could identify those mutations. So if you run a strictly methods-based uh, validation with a spectrum of variant types, but you don't ask about specific mutations, you may ultimately, there's a finite, there is a finite chance that you may not be able to determine that, muta that pathogenic variant, if you will, uh, if, it, if it is in the patient sample. So we came back to this issue of methods-based versus gene or analyte-based and said, okay, it's very important that to the degree possible uh, for specific panels that you should include those types of specimens. The other element of this is to add extra specimens in your validation that contain variants that are technically difficult to detect that you specifically want to detect with your test. So it really comes back to how you design your test and what your test is essentially optimized for detection, and then how you describe your test uh, in terms of what is the purpose of the test and what is its capabilities, and then ultimately what are its limitations. Now this type of hybrid approach, though, is most applicable when you're dealing with a focused gene panel. This is uh, not feasible to do when you expand this out uh, very easily to uh, an entire exome or genome. The other thing we added in 2016 um, was uh, 
essentially requiring evidence for the genes in the test. Now, we had already stated this in our requirements, but we find that on any given year, there are certain points and topics that need to be further emphasized and uh, reiterated, if you will, in sort of new language. So um, one of the key things that is asked uh, about any given NGS test and any given gene that's present in it is, well, why is that gene included in the panel, for example, or why was that gene analyzed? And this really comes down to what is the strength of the gene-disease relationship. And correlating with this uh, is that uh, there is a uh, uh, sort of, if you will, a sort of a national initiative, kind of a partner initiative to the ClinVar database, which is called the ClinGen Initiative, which has been working on uh, developing criteria for gene inclusion. And I've listed a website there that keeps you, that you could refer to in terms of looking at what the activities of that um, group is up to. They are basically working on curation of specific disease areas, uh, curating genes, and they've also indicated sort of a spectrum of how they consider gene disease association. For each of these, from limited, moderate to definitive, they have a series of criteria that um, um, the, uh, uh, if you will, uh, are required to meet a given uh, term like moderate or definitive. Um, now, um, let's see here, our next slide. Okay. So proposed changes for 2017, these have been proposed. Uh, they're being reviewed within the College of American Pathologists. So addition of topic-specific requirements uh, in the area of molecular oncology, uh, specific uh, additional language are in the accreditation requirements as proposed, further emphasizing that laboratories uh, uh, val when they're validating their lower limit of detection that uh, it's very critical that um, uh, their validations fully uh, address this particular area. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, when a laboratory does a molecular oncology test, say a multi-gene panel uh, for solid tumors, uh, then uh, they may state that our limit of detection is 5% uh, or our limit of detection of, is 2.5% and uh, we're asking laboratories to better, uh, 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 essentially to further demonstrate uh, the sensitivity and specificity of their testing for their lower limit of detection. And this is becoming increasingly uh, important in terms of decisions regarding when to introduce therapy. In the world of microbiology, uh, we are now starting to see next generation sequencing uh, march forward in that area, both for specific viruses uh, such as cytomegalovirus, uh, HIV, but also this entire field of metagenomics where a patient might have a pneumonia that's undiagnosed. Uh, it's considered uh, probably secondary to some type of pathogen infection, so you'll take a a sputum sample or a bronchial uh, lavage sample and then basically sequence the sample so it has all kinds of normal bacteria and virus that live in us plus uh, normal cells plus potentially a pathogen. And this is a very complex process to essentially find the pathogenic needle in the haystack. Um, and uh, so we've written some beginning requirements uh, to introduce into that. Um, in the next slide, uh, this is there, the other uh, important proposed change is um, uh, in the area of molecular genomics or inherited disease, uh, we're seeing a growing number of laboratories using either exome or genome sequencing in the setting of patients with undiagnosed disorders, also referred to as sort of the diagnostic odyssey. Uh, this is often, this is sometimes being applied in adults, but more frequently being applied in the pediatric setting. And essentially the goal of this type of testing is to come up with the genetic basis of the disease. 
So we're asking laboratories that are performing this kind of testing to provide uh, us with a greater understanding of how they validate their ability to do this. So as part of what you'll, what kind of what I'm trying to relate is as the field is evolving, each year we are revising and editing the accreditation requirements to keep pace with the diversity and the complexity of how this technology is being applied. And it's really only, um, uh, it's gaining ground and escalating, if you will, in a very, uh, in ways that we couldn't have predicted five years ago. Okay, I'd like to uh, switch gears uh, a little bit and talk about proficiency testing. And uh, the next slide uh, is one that I'm sure you're all very familiar with is that uh, under CLIA labs that are certified are required to participate in, in proficiency testing, and it's really an indicator, an external indicator of their performance and their quality. And, CA, and the college does have deemed status to accredit and administer proficiency testing. Uh, not, uh, uh, so I think we'll move on from there. So the challenge we faced as we looked at this several years ago was how do we really provide proficiency testing for the growing diversity? How do we do it and how do we keep up? And next generation sequencing in the inherited disorder space and in the cancer space, if you will, really uh, has sort of three major areas currently. One are these so-called gene panels or multi-gene diagnostics that we observe both in the germline uh, inherited space and in the uh, cancer somatic variant space. Already uh, in the inherited disorders, disorder space, we have labs doing exome and whole genome primarily for um, these undiagnosed disorder scenarios. However, we are seeing an increasing number of laboratories that are doing exome sequencing as a technology, which is essentially to uh, sequence uh, the entire uh, coding region, all the genes that encode for proteins, and then uh, take that as a technology base and then uh, splice out of it only looking at the genes of interest for a particular uh, medical disorder, like a uh, like on cardiomyopathy, for example. In the world of cancer, although it's primarily a multi-gene uh, sequencing effort at this point in time, uh, already in clinical research trials, um, uh, many of the clinical research trials are doing uh, exomes or whole genome sequencing already on, on tumors, and I anticipate that that will transition over into in the clinical space at some point on the horizon. So we wanted to leverage the concept of what we call methods-based proficiency testing. So again, back to our concept of the validation. What's the lab's ability to detect the spectrum of variants in clinically relevant genes or those that they intend to test for? This is the primary analytical goal that we need to um, uh, uh, focus our attention on. And so uh, today um, I will talk about in greater detail about the first PT program that we launched, which was for germline variant detection. Uh, and I know that I understand from Donna that a number of the members of the audience are focused on issues related to oncology, and I would just want to say that I will touch base again on that topic a little bit later, um, but many of the principles that we're seeing here in approaches I think you'll find um, relevant to the oncology space. So when we began developing this PT program for inherited disorders, germline variant detection, uh, we already knew there was a growing number of applications, and I wanted to just, I just showed some examples here, like cardiomyopathies or um, retinopathies of the eye, and in which uh, labs set up these uh, gene panels that might have only 10 or 12 genes in them, but they may have a couple hundred genes in them. And so this just is a logistical 
uh, been very interesting to think through the logistics of how to provide proficiency testing for this. So our approach to date has been the following, uh, is we first had to basically identify or, gener or develop a, uh, a human genome that we would characterize and understand its properties that we could use for proficiency testing. So we actually have a highly consented uh, uh, genome uh, uh, that um, is derived from an individual uh, who was willing, who donated blood, and the blood uh, had a cell line made from it and the cell line is grown up and we extract DNA from it. We sequenced it with multiple technologies, um, exome, genome sequencing approaches, uh, and then we generated a consensus of what was different in that genome from the reference sequence, and then we select variants uh, from that for proficiency testing. We conducted a pilot uh, for this, and then in 2015, we had an educational proficiency testing uh, process. Uh, that is twice in 2015, we sent out this material to laboratories and asked them to analyze it and provide uh, their responses. And then in 2016, we actually launched what we refer to as the graded proficiency testing program. And as you can see from this type of process, it's very involved. It does take a couple of years from conception to introduction for these proficiency testing uh, programs. Uh, they are quite involved to develop uh, a considerable amount of resources are required to develop a single proficiency testing program. Uh, here's just a picture from the CAP catalog for this particular proficiency testing program. Um, Georgia, Warren, please come to the lobby. Excuse me while there's an overhead announcement. Warren, please come to the lobby. Okay, that's gone. We had to, uh, we chose, after much discussion, uh, we selected 200 chromosomal positions or intervals in genes that are involved in a variety of inherited disorders. Uh, it was a balance of how many positions could we ask laboratories to interrogate um, if their test interrogated it versus the volume of information that we could receive and process within the college. And the genes, as I said, were inherited disorder associated genes and the positions were both reference, that is the same as the reference sequence or wild type, and also single nucleotide variants and small insertions and deletions. And now I'm going to show you some statistics and data uh, over the next several slides and then I'll get into some performance, uh, uh, preliminary performance data. And uh, I'll upfront apologize a bit for uh, this being now into a lot of uh, technical information, but it really is what we need to look at in order to understand how this program is working and how laboratories are um, performing. So uh, what I've shown here is the uh, I showed both I'm showing both the 2015 A and B mailings, which were, as I noted, educational. So laboratories participated in them. They received feedback, but they were not officially graded as laboratories, but in 2016 there were. You can see the number of laboratories that are enrolled in this particular program for inherited disorder germline variant detection. Uh, it's remained relatively steady. Below I said the number of labs returning results. We give them a due date when they have to have their results back in. and uh, and. And so we have we say by this date, if your results are in, we'll we'll review them and provide feedback and grading. So you can see that from 2015 up to 2016, uh, we're now at a point where about 90% of the labs that participate uh, actually are returning their results in a timely fashion. Most of these laboratories are based in the United States. We do have some international participants. Uh, in this program as well. 
The, this is a, uh, an interesting slide from my perspective. These are the types of assays that are being performed by the participating laboratories and uh, multi-gene panels, exomes, whole genomes. Um, and uh, one of the trends you can see in this is uh, that the number of laboratories performing exome sequencing uh, is on the rise. The number of labs performing whole genome sequencing has stayed relatively low. Um, it will probably continue to be relatively low for the next couple of years, but then I think it will start to, um, uh, uh, start to rise as laboratories that are performing exome for undiagnosed disorders convert over to whole genome sequencing. This is um, a now focusing only on 2016. Um, this gives you an appreciation of the types of instruments or platforms that laboratories are using for this survey. And as you can see, there is an interesting diversity of platforms that are being utilized for uh, the analysis of the uh, proficiency testing uh, program and, and hence reflecting what is being used in the laboratories for clinical testing. Um, and uh, there is a, a continued dominance of um, uh, use of the Illumina sequencing technology, although it's in different forms and iterations of their uh, platforms. Now I'd like to show you some preliminary performance data, and I want to emphasize that this is preliminary data. This is summary data of all the laboratories participating. This is, this is um, uh, how we approach this. So I want to show you some of the, the types of chromosomal positions in the uh, two uh, surveys that were sent out in 2016. Uh, uh, in the A mailing, most of the, uh, uh, more of the positions were referenced than in the B mailing. Uh, and then you can see the number of single nucleotide variants. You'll see the relative paucity of insertions and deletions. And this just reflects the fact that within any given genome, within coding regions, there are many fewer insertions and deletions available from which to choose to uh, test laboratories on compared to uh, single nucleotide variants or reference uh, positions. We did have an is uh, somewhat of an issue that, uh, that Ryan, sorry about lobby. that. Georgia, Ryan, please come to the lobby. Um, that um, uh, we are finding some issues between what is referred to as the variant as described in the human genome reference versus how the variants are described in the uh, transcript references. And we're, we, in, we in laboratories are working through that particular issue so that some of the positions we had to not grade. Uh, but that's uh, coming down as we are understanding what, what laboratories, how they're approaching this. So um, this is now getting a little bit deeper into the data, the 2016 A mailing and the B mailing for the reference or wild type positions that were analyzed. There were, in the A mailing, there were 139 positions. The number of labs analyzing those positions was anywhere from 12 to 68. So let me put uh, this into a different perspective. So for example, there might be a position, a reference position, that's in the gene for BRCA1, like for BRCA1. Um, and perhaps 68 of the laboratories participating happen to have a gene panel for inherited predisposition to cancer and they test for BRCA1. That's why there might be a number such as 68. Another position might be in a gene that's much less frequently tested um, uh, by because uh, uh, it's a, a, a gene that's in, involved with rarer disorders, so we have fewer labs testing for that. But there was about a mean of 26 labs. And then in 2016 uh, B mailing, we had a mean about 31 labs for the 90 reference positions. So let's look a little bit at how they performed. 
on the A and B mailing. Uh, so the key thing is that if it's a reference position, and we direct the laboratory to that position in the sample and say, tell us what you see at this chromosomal, ref this chromosomal position. If it's reference, if there's no variant there, they should tell us that there's no variant detected. So the correct response in this table is no variant detected. And what you can see is that about 95% per percent plus, 95% uh, or plus of the laboratories will say there's no variant detected there. Okay. Obviously, uh, the, the ultimate response in a, you know, that one wants to see from laboratories at large is that 100% of the labs say there's no variant detected at this position. I would like to stress that in the world of inherited disorder and germline testing, that the majority of laboratories, before they report an answer, uh, particularly a pathogenic variant, if you will, often do a confirmation of that next generation sequencing result with another technology. For example, typically a Sanger sequencing of the region to sort of basically double check the, the result before reporting it. So anyway, this gives you some preliminary uh, understanding of how laboratories are actually performing on the reference positions. Uh, here's some data on the single nucleotide variant analysis for the A and B mailing. There were, in the A mailing, there were 50 single nucleotide variants. Now, this is a single change, a single base change in the genome. Uh, and you can see the range of labs answering, so a mean of 43. Um, and in the B mailing, uh, we had 108 of the SNB uh, single nucleotide variant positions. So let's look at how the labs did uh, in this regard. So in this case, you want laboratories to be able to actually detect the variant because a variant is present. So in this case, you can see that 92 to 94 percent of the time uh, for all the labs that participated and responded to this position, um, that they actually detected the variant. Okay. Moving forward, um, uh, in the 2016A mailing, we were we we were able to include three, uh, uh, two deletions and one insertion. Um, and uh, we did not have one that we could actually grade in the B mailing because, of, again, of the limitation of these uh, uh, types of positions. But I want to focus your attention on this response, which is there are insertions or deletions at these positions, and the number of labs that were providing responses was anywhere from around, around 50 to 45. And what you'll see is that anywhere from 77 or so percent to 84 percent of labs actually detected these insertions and deletions. So that means that the detection rate is lower than we observed overall for the participants in the single nucleotide variants. And this is a known uh, aspect of uh, some of the technical limitations of next generation sequencing. So our observations, uh, my, my sense of this is that the evaluation of the data that we have so far is that the evaluation of the labs performing for reference positions and single nucleotide variants uh, is what I would call relatively solid performance. Uh, and certainly the detection of insertions and deletions is an area that uh, needs improvement. Uh, and that's uh, not unexpected uh, from what we know about the technology. Uh, we need to be able to source proficiency testing materials that will uh, uh, provide a greater number of challenges in the area of insertions and deletions uh, for laboratories. They're important not only for inherited disorders, but also for cancer uh, diagnostics. Uh, and as I noted, we did not require the labs to Sanger confirm their results before answering the survey questions. And the reason we did not do that was just the um, uh, amount of cost that it would have uh, added to laboratories. So uh, this is just circling back to an earlier slide. I'm going to wrap up with a few additional pieces of data for you. 
Um, we do have a proficiency testing that has been launched uh, for the detection of somatic variants in solid tumors. Uh, this is the CAP catalog. You can see under the additional information the types of genes that are uh, being interrogated in this, this particular survey. Uh, for those of you more involved with oncology, you'll see there they are the usual suspects. You can see the enrollment numbers of laboratories uh, for this particular proficiency testing. There's also a proficiency testing for somatic variants in hematologic uh, malignancies. Uh, and there are the genes indicated, and there are the enrollment numbers for 2016. And then uh, the last data slide, uh, we do have a program that we have launched in which laboratories receive sequence data files that we have um, uh, manipulated in silico to introduce examples of, of mutations, pathogenic variants, into them. And then these are sent to laboratories, uh, and they're being analyzed by laboratories. So they actually don't receive a sample to sequence. They receive a data file to analyze. And uh, this is for two specific uh, 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 commercially available reagent sets, either from Illumina or an ion torrent that a number of labs are using. And so you can see the enrollment figures uh, for that particular program. And so I, uh, it's hard in one 45-minute presentation to cover all the pertinent areas, but I hope I've given you today a little bit of a, a sort of a, if you will, a flavor of the activities we have ongoing and how laboratories are doing. So that's essentially the end of my particular presentation. I, I note over here in the chat box that uh, there are some questions coming in, but I'm going to hold off for a moment and, and figure out how we're going to approach these. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Volker Jing. So this, this is uh, Donald Messner again. Um, we do have a number of questions in the chat box, uh, and I wanted to uh, um, ask our operator to open up. Uh, would you please give people instructions if they want? I'm not sure we'll be able to get to voice questions, but um, I want to give people the option anyway. Could you please give people instructions on how to do that? Absolutely. If you would like to ask a question, simply press the star key followed by the digit 1 on your telephone keypad. Also, if you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. And a voice prompt on your phone line will indicate when your line has been open to ask a question. And once again, that's star 1 to ask a question. Okay, and in the meanwhile, um, we're going to try to deal with some of these written in questions. Um, and I'm, I, I'm actually going to start with the last one first. Um, Deb Collier, who is a, uh, a patient advocate from uh, Patient Advocates and Research, asked the question. She expressed um, um, concern that variant detection levels are not 100% accurate, and she said patients need to know this. She wants to know what the plans are to help get labs to 100% of detecting variants. And I'll add, uh, add my own little um, sort of related question, which is that you mentioned that 90% of returning labs are returning results in a timely fashion. And I wondered what happens with those other 10% of labs. Um, OK. Um, well, let's see. Let me start with the, with the uh, Return. So we, we provide the proficiency testing material. We send it out to laboratories that have subscribed to the program. And then we tell them what the due date is. Um, it's important to realize that, uh, that while the majority of the laboratories that sign up for the proficiency testing program are laboratories that are either uh, accredited by the College of American Pathologists or accredited by CLIA, that not, that's not a requirement for them to participate in the program. So we have research laboratories, even uh, sort of clinical pharma, like pharmaceutical laboratories that sign up for our program because they want the material, they want to participate, uh, but they don't always turn their results in. So um, it, it's important to realize that laboratories that are performing these types of tests for clinical purposes, for patient purposes, have turnaround time deadlines 
for normal clinical uh, 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 procedures. So you really need to realize that, that laboratories that are performing the clinical testing have self-defined turnaround times that they are monitored on uh, and that, that they, that they uh, attempt to meet. In terms of the variant detection levels, uh, the question asked by uh, Deborah Collier, um, yes, I think this is, um, this is some, this technology, um, the sequencing and the data analysis is a, is a complex technology. It is not a perfect technology. Uh, there's typically no technology, diagnostic technology that's perfect. So what's very important is that uh, when laboratories offer a particular test, they provide information on what are the limitations of their test. They need to provide information on how sensitive their test is, how specific or accurate their test is, um, and uh, that's an important part of evaluating um, uh, essentially a clinical laboratory is what is their performance uh, of their particular testing. The other important thing about proficiency testing is that 2016 is the first year that we're actually grading these um, uh, analyses and providing them back. And what we know from other uh, historical proficiency testing is that once we introduce a program and we begin to grade it, is that as time marches forward, and I'm marching forward in terms of, year, of, of the next few years, we should anticipate that the performance of laboratories will improve because they will be getting feedback, external feedback, um, on you know, an external uh, indicator of how they're doing. And when they see that, wow, well, we missed this particular variant, they are obligated to go back and review their data and ask why did we miss this particular variant um, in this particular region of the genome of the sample. And through that kind of feedback process, laboratories will be expected to um, overall uh, improve their uh, performance. As a caveat, I started working with this technology um, essentially around 2007, uh, so almost a decade ago. And what I, I can relate is that even within that 10-year interval, the performance of the technology itself has markedly improved. So I think we can expect uh, continual improvements. Um, oh, uh, thank you. Um, so from Eric Lynn at uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, for the limit of detection and oncology testing, is CAP working on proficiency testing for cell-free DNA testing and or circulating tumor DNA? Okay, I'm just scrolling up. I, I found the question. I'm learning how to <laughs> um, I, Okay, yes, the, um, there, uh, the, the, uh, within the college we have several uh, 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 committees that are now uh, working on uh, specific areas of proficiency testing for uh, different topics, one of which is essentially that, is working on a proficiency testing program for cell-free DNA testing, uh, and that is in the planning stages as we speak. And as I noted, um, it typically takes um, uh, about two years from concept to launch uh, and so it's in the concept, uh, concept development phase currently. Uh, often developing these proficiency testing programs, we need to identify an external partner or commercial vendor to work with the CAP to actually generate the material. All right, thank you. So the question from Brian Loy of Humana, the bioinformatics participant numbers seem low. Can you comment on how many labs we should expect to see for bioinformatic proficiency testing and other proficiency testing numbers? Okay. Um, I, I just, if you're still looking at the slides, I reversed the slides to that bioinformatics proficiency testing. Let me point out that this particular bioinformatics proficiency testing program is specific to two commercial available reagents, the Illumina TrueSeq Amplicon Cancer Panel 
or the ion torn Ampliceed Cancer Hotspot Panel. So when you look at labs doing oncology testing, many of them are using other reagent sets um, uh, than these. So, in, so uh, a lot of those uh, individuals are participating in other proficiency testing. So actually the numbers here that I wrote for 2016A, like 43 slash 34, that represents the number that are participating using that Illumina or ion torrent specific set of reagents. So it may seem low relative to the other numbers, but it probably isn't because it reflects that only a subset of the labs are using these particular uh, reagent sets. We are in the process of, uh, again, in development and concept stage of being able to provide a broader spectrum of bioinformatic challenges to laboratories. And one day we hope to have it almost on a per laboratory customized basis so that all labs could participate in this, which will allow us to test them for a greater range of the types of variants that they may observe that we're limited to do with physical samples. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid that we have come to the uh, end of the time that we have allotted for this webinar. Um, there are a number of questions we haven't gotten to. We will um, uh, provide answers to those questions and post them with the, uh, with the webinar, uh, and, and we'll get back to those folks with unanswered questions that way. Um, uh, so, uh, so we will answer your questions. Thank you very much to uh, Dr. Volkerding and the College of American Pathologists and everyone who took the time to, to call in today on the webinar. Thanks very much.